Oh, hey everyone. I didn't even realize I was live. I forgot I hit go live. <laughs> Sorry, you got to see me adjusting my crap for three minutes. How's everyone doing? Um, I was trying to get the live going on uh, on TikTok here. Um, so we can try and gain some new followers. All right, I think I got her set up now. There we go. That should be good. Let's adjust this phone a little bit. Oops, wrong way. All right. Okay, should be good. How's everyone doing? I'm going to move this one just a little bit. Okay. That should be good. Whoa, look at how many viewers we have on Twitch and YouTube already. How's it going, everybody? Uh, we are live on TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Um, if you want to see me share my screen, see the stuff that uh, we'll be reacting to today, um, go ahead and follow us on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook. Um, yeah, but we'll also be doing the stream on, on TikTok if people just want to hop in. Good morning in Russian. Good morning in Russian to you as well. I don't know what good morning in Russia is, but um, I hope everyone in Russia is having a good morning. Hope everyone everywhere is having a good morning. LOL, classic. Yeah, true. Um, for those TikTok followers who don't know, while I was setting up the Twitch and YouTube stream, um, I accidentally hit go live while I was still setting up the TikTok stream. Um, and I didn't realize it. So for about two and a half minutes, I was trying to set up my TikTok. <laughs> uh, whoops. Hey, yo, haha. The boss makes a dollar. I make a dime. That's why I'm watching Midwestern Marks on company time. Darn right, baby. And that's why we do our midday streams, you know, for, for the proletarians out there grinding um, who need some entertainment at work, you know. Um Come to the Midwestern Marks Twitch or the Midwestern Marks YouTube. Sup, man? You okay? Been so long since I watched your vids. I'm totally good. My other account got banned. It's probably why it's been a while since you've watched my vids. Um, I'm doing great. I have a YouTube channel and a Twitch that haven't been banned. So that's what I'm streaming on right now. And yeah, things are going well. <laughs> What's up, Betty? Greetings from Germany. Oh, very cool. Thanks for tuning into the stream. Uh, what part of Germany are you in? Thank you for being here. Hi, Eddie and everyone. Hello, Happy 65. Welcome back. Hello, Peta Mio. Hello from Southwest Florida. Patrick Massey in Southwest Florida. How's it going? Um, did you did you run into any hurricane issues? Or did you see um, the hurricane or any high winds? I, I imagine you did um, in Southwest Florida. Hello from Ireland. Hello. Austin, Texas, checking in. Very cool. Very cool. People from all around the world today. Thank you. Just survived a hurricane and I'm back at work listening to Midwestern Marks. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry your boss didn't give you a break. I'm not surprised. Um, you know, who cares about the trauma that you may have experienced while surviving a deadly hurricane? Um, Got to get back to work and... and make surplus value for the boss, but I'm glad that uh, you're back to <laughs> back to listening to Midwest Remarks. Glad you're okay. Hope you didn't encounter any property damage. Hello from Central Florida. What up? What up? What up? Um, I actually, so since we have so many people from Florida, then let's make the first thing we cover the hurricane. Hurricane Ian, because I have a bunch of articles pulled up that I want to talk about today. Um, TikTok people, we're happy you're with us, happy you're tuning into the live. If you want to see the articles that we're reacting to, um, and if you want to see my screen, uh, you got to go follow us on Twitch or YouTube um, or Facebook at Midwestern Marks, where we're live streaming right now, um, if you want to see it. So yeah, this is the... This is an article I read from CNN this morning. Hurricane Ian's death toll rises as crews in Florida go door to door in search of survivors in decimated neighborhoods. Um, 
there was also one that said various um, various homes that were basically on islands in Florida have been decimated now. Um, there were some pictures of this on Twitter, like the the island type luxury homes in Florida that are just basically on the water um, that obviously got absolutely obliterated by the hurricane. And, um, you know, if you look at we're going to talk about Cuba in a second. We're standing in a mangrove hurricane. And I counted some disaster relief dozen plus. Whoops, accidentally played a video. Um, but the way that Florida houses are designed are not, you know, the infrastructure is not designed to sustain a natural disaster like this, right? There's a lot more that could be done, a lot more money that could be invested into not only disaster relief, but disaster prevention. And the way that the housing and the neighborhoods uh, and the infrastructure overall is structured is not necessarily structured in a good way to combat a hurricane. Like I was saying, they have little like island houses. They have a bunch of houses that almost look like they're floating on top of the water. Um, so obviously those are going to get destroyed by a hurricane. But, you know, you have these giant luxury housing developers and these giant real estate companies um, just building housing wherever they can, wherever there's high population um, or, yeah, high income populations uh, who can afford those housing. And it's a perfect example of exchange value over use value. All right. Just go back to the most basic Marxist concept you can exchange value. Um, the or capitalist production is the cap or the production of surplus value, which is measured in exchange value, how much a commodity can be exchanged for other things represented as money. So uh, that sounds complicated, but basically capitalists and luxury real estate developers are building houses um, that will make them the most money rather than building the houses that bring people the most use value, use value, the houses that are the most useful commodity to people. You know, houses that are designed to be sustainable, houses that are designed for disaster prevention. Um, instead of this, you know, we just have houses that are basically designed for luxury and houses that are designed for profit, um, which has effects when it comes to the climate crisis um, and has effects when we're dealing with um, tropical storms and stuff, natural disasters, which may, you know, continue to increase with the climate crisis, probably will. Um so that is Florida, all right? That's how Florida has dealt with it. Um, pretty devastating. Many houses are destroyed. Many people are displaced. Uh, as CNN said there, you have people going door to door. But, you know, the government response to these natural disasters is, is still not what it should be, right? They still do not take care of people the way that they should. And because of capitalism, right, if your home gets destroyed, the bank's going to tell you you're shit out of luck, you know, unless you have homeowner's insurance that you pay for every single month um, or hurricane insurance or whatever, which is an, an added premium or an added cost that they use to profit off you, um, use to profit off your fear of hurricanes. Uh, but the U.S. response to, to these natural disasters is not what it could be, especially if you look at like the military, like Ian Angus in his book, Facing the Anthropocene, um, suggests that the military, or at least part of it, be transformed into what he calls climate corps. So basically just um, humanitarian relief, right? So when a hurricane hits Florida, you send a bunch of the National Guard there and they help people, they rescue people, they do construction projects, they rebuild the infrastructure. Um, and, you know, my, my roommate's in the Army, uh, or he's in the National Guard. He's a drill right now, just sitting in a barrack. They just sit in barracks and, and really don't do anything. They do training from time to time, you know, and then if you get deployed, obviously um, you do something then. But a lot of the time, the military, you know, is having their resources, their energy and their time wasted uh, when it could be diverted to something like cleanup, rescue, um, reconstruction, uh, stuff like that. Um, but of course, we have a capitalist imperialist government, not a socialist government that helps people. So they don't do that. Um, TikTok fans or TikTok viewers, we are live on uh, Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube as well. Uh, join us over there for the full experience. Thank you for being here, though. Sorry, I just figured I'd say that. But anyways, Biden has still been bragging about all the aid that, that he's given to Puerto Rico, though, in the Biden administration, the Biden White House. Um, 
despite the fact that they've been giving about the same amount of aid to Puerto Rico that Donald Trump did. They increased it a little bit. Um, the one thing that they did do better than Trump, and you know, here's one way, one way at least where Biden has actually been better than Trump. When Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico in 2017, Trump originally withheld funds. He said, we're not going to help you with this at all. We're not going to give you any disaster relief, even though Puerto Rico is a territory and the U.S. controls them like a colony. Um, it refuses to give Puerto Rico their independence because they want to exploit Puerto Rican resources. Um, despite that, we never take care of Puerto Rico when there's a hurricane. And, and Donald Trump literally said, we're not going to give you anything um, until eventually he did. Eventually, he gave about the same amount that Biden's giving. Um, but again, Biden's been publishing all these things about how much his administration is giving to Puerto Rico, but it's basically just the media, you know, a media blitz, uh, a media fluff up of Biden just talking about Puerto Rico. Biden's sending money to Puerto Rico. Biden's sending money to Puerto Rico. They say it over and over and over again, when in reality, he's giving about the same amount to Puerto Rico that Trump gave. Um, which is still far from being enough. And in this book by Dan Kovalik, uh, The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela, he talks about Puerto Rico at one point. And I don't know when this book was written, like 2019, I think. And he says that Puerto Rico's disaster infrastructure, their disaster prevention infrastructure is not where it needs to be. It's not even close. It needs way more funding um, if we're going, or if they're going to, uh, survive another hurricane like Hurricane Maria, you know, if they're going to have a better chance of, of helping people survive uh, this deadly hurricane. Um, but they didn't. I mean, Biden invested a little bit into that disaster infrastructure. But like I said, it's not any more than what the U.S. has been investing into Puerto Rico's disaster infrastructure. So, again, Hurricane Ian um, or Hurricane Fiona, the, the last um, hurricane that hit Puerto Rico, has had devastating effects, absolutely devastating effects. So, you know, I guess I can say this all I want, though, right? I can say that the U.S. isn't doing enough to help Puerto Rico. The U.S. isn't doing enough to help Florida. They're giving money, but it's not enough money. They're sending people to help, but it's not enough people to help. You know, but how do I know that for sure? How can I know for sure that the U.S. isn't doing enough or isn't doing everything they can? I know that for sure because Hurricane Ian hit Cuba. And Danny Haifong says this, in Cuba, no one dies or becomes homeless from a natural disaster. Not a single life was taken by Hurricane Ian in Cuba. In Florida, hundreds are assumed dead from the same hurricane. Don't let anyone tell you that there isn't a massive difference between socialism and capitalism. So true. And Cuba's infrastructure was hit hard. Their electrical grid was hit hard which is an added um, negative for them or an added problem for them because of the U.S. embargo, because the U.S. is surrounding them with their troops and not letting them trade with the outside world, so it's hard to get resources in to develop new infrastructure. But even despite that, because Cuba focused all their country's resources, because they focused their country's surplus, their country's labor, their government's efforts on disaster relief, and because they don't have a capitalist system of housing in Cuba, so everybody has a house um, and they're not insanely expensive. You're not paying an exorbitant rent costs to a landlord every month. Because of that, hurricanes don't make people homeless in Cuba. You know, they're resettled by the government. And we saw something very similar um, in Cuba's response to the pandemic, where they had something like under 100 people die from the pandemic. You know, and then we have the U.S. telling us that they can't do this you know, they can't help us and we all just need to get back to work, you know, and, and we need to be fiscally responsible and we can't spend any money on the people. We have to keep sending billions of dollars to fight more wars. They tell you this over and over and over again to the point where some people have been indoctrinated with this ideology and they actually believe it. Meanwhile, Cuba, who's under an embargo, a small island country right under the nose of the U.S. empire, is combating these pandemics and these natural disasters way better than the U.S., investing their resources in their people, not investing their resources in endless war and militarism all around the world like the U.S., and they're having better results. Their people are getting better res results because socialism is superior to capitalism. Having a planned economy um, that's, that's 
oriented towards helping people and making people's lives better and bringing people out of poverty, um, that is better than the capitalist system. And that's why Cuba did better with the hurricane response. Thank you very much to Doug, David, Argenti, Lori Don, UE. Wow, my friend, you have a long name. But thank you very, very much for the super chat. Uh, $2.79 super chat coming in from California. It says, workers and peasants of the world unite. You bet. Thank you very much for your support, David. You are the reason Midwestern Marks exists. That's not true. We would probably exist even if people, if you got, if we didn't have any Patreon supporters um, or if we didn't have uh, super chatters, we'd probably still do these videos. We just wouldn't be able to do as many <laughs> and they wouldn't look very good. Cuba is a revisionist country that uses embargo and blockade as an excuse for everything. Well, they didn't use it as an excuse for the hurricane. <laughs> they didn't have anyone die or go homeless. But, you know, like, what do you mean they use it as an excuse for anything? The U.S. is surrounding their country with their military and preventing them from, I mean, they do they do blame it for everything. Um, I guess that is a fair critique to make of the Cuban government. Sometimes, you know, there are internal contradictions, which they'll solely blame on um, imperialism. And imperialism is having an effect, you know, but. It's, it's good to look inward and be inwardly critical, too. But Cuba is, you know, they are inwardly critical, um, unless you're only learning about Cuba through the U.S. State Department um, and, and U.S. corporate media. Um, but yeah, I mean, they do blame a lot of stuff on the embargo. But like with Hurricane Ian, the U.S. is surrounding them with their military and not allowing them to trade, not allowing them to export or import goods. So like, yeah, that's having a huge effect on the everyday life of the people. And that's insane. That's murderous. That's heinous that the U.S. would do this to people during a pandemic or during a natural disaster or any time at all. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do see the criticism that the Cuban government blames everything on the blockade, but the blockade affects every aspect of Cuban life. And that doesn't mean they're revisionist. <laughs> uh, Cuba has a reason to blame it for everything, to be fair. Exactly. Power just came back on at my job. Oh, wow. There you go. They got the electrical grid running again in Florida. Um, oh, the last thing I wanted to mention about Hurricane Ian, though, the last thing I had written down. Um, in the era of the climate crisis, right, where we'll probably see tropical storms. I'm not saying Hurricane Ian was a direct result of climate change, right? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. The scientists... I've seen, we're like, you know, be careful. You don't want to just say this, this storm is directly from climate change. It could be making it worse. We don't know. We have to look at it and do actual research. That's how science works. Um, but in the era of the climate crisis, as it get, gets worse, we probably will see more tropical storms. We will see more hurricanes. We will see more destruction like that. And I think this shows the importance of mutual aid for communists, right? For there to be, like I said, the U.S. military isn't doing anything to help. The U.S. government isn't going to do anything to help. The capitalists aren't doing anything to help or, or not enough, right? So if we have strong, organized communist parties um, in every area, in every locality, when a natural disaster hits and people need help, the communists can mobilize, right? We can mobilize and help the community so people start to see, oh, when I can't trust the government, when I can't trust the capitalists, I can trust those communists. I can trust those socialists you know, who were willing to drop everything once the hurricane hit and start helping our community rebuild, you know, show people what, um, what socialism could be, you know, uh, what a society could be where we help each other and actually use our resources to um, come together and cooperate and survive uh, when you have a hurricane or something like that. Tom Smith, thank you for the $10 super chat, Tom Smith, really appreciate that. Um, I have two uncles named Tom Smith, so it's it's a pretty generic name, but um, they're two of my favorite people in the world. So, uh, just watch Loyal Citizens of Pyongyang. Thank you for the recommendation. Any other sources on North Korea? Wow, I'm very glad you watched that movie. Thank you for watching it. It is a fantastic movie. Um, everybody should watch Loyal Citizens of Pyongyang. Um, the first source I'm going to recommend to you. 
um, outside of that is the hour long podcast we did with Professor Derek Ford of the Liberation School. So the Liberation School, I believe, are the ones who made Loyal Citizens of Pyongyang. Um, and we interviewed Derek Ford, who's a member of PSL, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, which the Liberation School is attached to. Um, talked to him for an hour about his time in the South, his time in the North, because he's traveled all over North and South Korea. Um, the lies of U.S. media, the lies about North Korea that happen in academia, because Derek Ford is a professor. Um, so he's critical of the way that the colleges and academics promote imperialist propaganda about North Korea. Um, so I just sent that podcast in the chat. And then another one I really like to recommend is called My Brothers and Sisters in the North. Um, which is where a journalist goes to the North and just kind of shows what life is like, you know, shows what everyday life is like, shows what the farmers are doing, um, goes to the water park in Pyongyang and, you know, basically just shows that the way that Americans think about North Koreans is racist, right? Where it's like, oh, they're just a bunch of crazy people who run around bowing down to pictures of Kim Jong-un all day. Like, no, they're just people, you know, they have pictures of Kim Jong-un hanging up, just like we have statues of George Washington carved into the side of mountains in America, you know, just like we um, show reverence and, you know, uh, build statues of our leaders. They do the same thing. But just like us, they work every day. They have to farm every day. And, and uh, my brothers and sisters in the north um, shows what that daily farming is like and what the cooperative farms are like. What's it like to work um, at a place, I think, where they're sewing in North Korea? What's it like to be in manufacturing? Um, so you get to see that every, you know, the day-to-day -day life or, yeah, the day-to-day -day life of the North Korean people. And you realize, oh, of course, they're just people, right? They're, the U.S. has convinced me that all these people are just bad shit, um, which is just an absurd thing to believe. Um, and then there's also a really good playlist on YouTube called like everything know about about North Korea. Probably wrong, I think it's called. Sorry, I know I'm shaking my camera right now because um, I'm trying to type and find these for you. Yeah. So this is a really good YouTube playlist, actually. Just a playlist of random videos. Um, it has the video like we went to North Korea to get a haircut um where these guys just go to north korea and get a haircut because u.s tabloids um like tmz and whatnot people magazine were saying that everyone in north korea has to get the same haircut and then they were saying they were saying that and they were saying everybody in north korea is banned from getting kim jong-un's haircut uh so they said everybody has to get the same haircut and everyone's banned from getting the haircut at the same time but these guys these two dudes just decided to go to north korea and test that theory um, and they asked for a, an, an American white man their haircut or something like that. Um, and, and the North Korean barber cuts their hair, just like barbers in America do, or barbers all over the world. Um, and you see that the, the U.S. tabloids and the U.S. media narrative about North Korea was completely made up. Uh, this idea that you can only get a certain kind of haircut in North Korea, they just made it up printed it in the American media, pretended like it was true, never published a retraction because uh, they're a bunch of liars. Uh, but yeah, this is a good playlist. There's also the gray zones got um, how the NED and US NGOs medal in North Korea. Got one from Empire Files here. Um, one criticizing CNN, loyal citizens of Pyongyang is in here. Um, so I will send the link to that playlist right now. And yeah, there's a bunch of resources on North Korea for y'all. Hello, TikTok friends. Be sure to join us on Twitch and YouTube and Facebook at Midwestern Marks for the full stream. Uh, hopefully that's enough resources. Gotta go to the bathroom soon, y'all. I'm going to have to take a rest soon. Not a rest. I just got to go to the bathroom soon. The DPRK is kind of healthy. That society everyone wants, except capitalists. It's true. That was one of the weirdest things when you like, not one of the weirdest things, but one of the most surprising things when I talked to Derek Ford, he was like, the main thing you notice when you're in the North is like the communal mode of life that they have. The mode of life that's so much different from capitalism, where you're just grinding, 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 grinding every day. You're all on your own. It's totally individualistic. 
you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps um, versus having a communal society where there's collective farming and they're trying to construct socialism and, and meet everybody's needs where they're also under, you know, a stringent 70 year long embargo from the U S after the U S killed 20% of their population. But um, it's created this really communal um, society, socialistic society. Some people say the DPRK is like the most socialist country in the world. Um, I don't know if that's correct or not, but um, it makes sense. And like Derek Ford was telling us, you have kids running around in the middle of the night, right? Not like super late at night, but just running around in the streets um, because they don't have as much crime. They, you know, they don't have... Uh, the same kind of concerns that an American parent would have if their kids are running around in the streets of, of American city streets um, late at night, you know? And, and he also said you have like soldiers and police officers walking around in the DPRK. Um, and they also, they participate in the community. So like I was saying with having the soldiers uh, do relief um, whenever there's like a, a hurricane or something um, in the previous segment, uh, North Korea has stuff like that, as does China. The People's Liberation Army has been doing this forever. They participate in community welfare programs. They com uh, participate in construction projects. Uh, so the people know the troops a lot better. It's a lot more cohesive. Um, and, you know, the, the military, the army are usually of the people. Um, so you have like troops and police walking around um, and kids will just run up to them and talk to them and play with them and stuff. It's not like the U.S. where you see a cop and you're like, Ugh. E -e -e, I hope he doesn't see me going two miles over the speed limit and give me a ticket. Um, yeah, or shoot me. North Korea has always been an ally of decolonization in Africa. That's true, too. Um, always been an ally of Palestine. Uh, always been an ally of the anti-colonial struggles in Africa and Latin America. Thoughts on Juche? I haven't studied it in depth. Um, good question, though. My great grandparents are from Yugoslavia, Slovenia, and missed the good old days. My great grandfather was a partisan and got to meet Tito. Very cool. Wow. What a family history you have. I'm a little bit jealous. Um, no offense to my family history. Uh, my grandpa was a rail worker. He also, oh, my, gran my grandpa also fought in the Korean War. Uh, he told me all he did was spy on communists. I still love you, Grandpa. Um, but that's very cool. Right? Yours are from Yugoslavia and got to meet Tito. Very cool. Very cool. All right. We're going to talk about Iran when I get back. Um, but I, I need a piece so bad. Like, it's out of control. So I'm going to play something for y'all during the intermission. Don't you worry. TikTok people, I'm sorry. I, I have nothing I can play you. You just got to come join us on Twitch and YouTube at Midwestern March. It's better anyways. Um, all the cool people are over here. So so you might as well you might as well hop on over here anyways and, and like the stream, subscribe, share the stream. Make sure to favorite the stream, follow us on Twitch, subscribe on Twitch, do all that good stuff. All right. I will find a wrestling video that y'all have never seen. Here we go. I kicked this kid's butt, if I remember correctly. This is from years ago. Um, I'm in the purple.
I'm back. Am I winning? I told myself this stream I was going to commentate some wrestling matches. Like I was, I'm going to start teaching y'all how to wrestle. Teach y'all some self-defense. This guy was not very good, though. <laughs> I don't know if this guy had any wins all season, actually. He was pretty bad for college. I'm sure he was a decent high school wrestler. Nice moves. Thank you. Base DPRK didn't take sides in the Sino-Soviet split. That is pretty based. Vijay Prashad writes about that in... Um, believe it's red star over the third world is where he taught i think it is red star over the third world where he's saying that the sino-soviet split was really tough um for like other socialist movements in the third world or just all around the world um because they wanted unity you know and they and they didn't know what that meant for them like you know uh vijay prashad is talking about these various communist parties in india um, who then were facing splits, you know, facing themselves splintering um, because they had to take a side in the Sino-Soviet split. Like, you know, what if half the communists side with the Soviets and half side with uh, China? Then all of a sudden you have all these the splintering um, of the of socialist movements outside of the USSR and China because of what's going on between the USSR and China. Um, so at that point, a lot of movements started trying to go more independent, you know, started trying to just before that, a lot of them literally just did what the Soviets did. They literally just followed the Soviets model. That's what the communist party in the U S was doing. Uh, it was basically just the mini Soviet party taking, um, taking cues from the Soviet union. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of parties had to go their own way then after the Sino Soviet split. So very interesting time. Oh, I should have got my head on the knee. Dang it. I'm better than this now. TikTok people follow us on YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Midwestern Marks. Right now we're watching me wrestle <laughs> and talking about the Sino-Soviet split. So, I mean, what could be better content than that, you know? Uh, jam Flow Man says, kick his ass. Have you heard of the Jam Flow Man? Jam sickest in the singing bands in the land. Got that sent. Welcome all the new people. Yes, welcome. Thank you, Unparalleled Dev, for welcoming everyone. Feel free to like, comment, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. You still wrestle? I do. I wrestle in Greco now, though. So I'm not allowed to touch the legs anymore, which is interesting. But there you go. Wow, we're getting a lot of new people here. Hello to everyone who recently joined the Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook stream. Uh, be sure to give it a like uh, or a comment or a share or whatever you want to do. Um, but thank you for being here with us. Uh, I also coach. Um, I should have said that. So my grad program that I'm doing right now is a healthcare administration graduate program, get my graduate degree. Um, and then along with that, I'm a graduate assistant wrestling coach. Um, so I coach and practice and wrestle every day. Um, and then on top of that, I still compete in Greco Roman, which is like senior level stuff. Um, so above college age, um, last year I beat my first Olympian, um, go me, but that's what I'm trying to do now is like make the Olympics or make the world championships. Uh, I got fifth at the U S open last year, eighth or didn't place at the world team trials, had a bad tournament. I mean, everyone at the World Team Trials is obviously amazing. But. Let's go, Eddie. Woohoo! Yeah, go communism. We will take over the wrestling world. Wait, how old are you? I'm 25. I am 25. My birthday's in April. Eddie, what are your thoughts on Bo Nickel? Oh, for I mean, people need to check out our Midwestern Martial Arts account. If you're a fan of martial arts at all, um, me and my buddy, Matt literally have an account where, I mean, we do podcasts, but mostly we've been focusing on our TikTok, um, just cause it's easier you and I don't have a lot of time. Why there aren't any Oops. So I'll pull that up real quick. It's called Midwestern martial arts. Yeah. That's the name of it. Uh, 
Oh, where am I? So, yeah, this is where we talk about MMA, give our hot MMA takes. Um, and the one I made about Bo Nickel happened to go viral. You see it has 351,000 views. Um, so these are my thoughts on Bo Nickel. Yo, mixed martial arts fans who are calling Bo Nickel the American Khabib. Let me just tell you that y'all are in for a surprise. Khabib is not even in the same stratosphere as Bo Nickel. Not when it comes to wrestling and honestly not when it comes to just pure athleticism. Bo Nickel is honestly one of the best wrestlers I've ever seen. He won nationals at three different weight classes and made it look like he wasn't trying. He would pin college athletes with moves that I probably couldn't do on a second grader. The entire UFC middleweight division is in huge trouble. Yo, mixed martial arts fans who are calling Bo Nick. I had myself muted, sorry. That's what I think of Bo Nickel. Uh, Bo Nickel is one of the best wrestlers I've ever watched in my life. Um, Bo Nickel uh, iced the NCAA championships one year for his team while wrestling Miles Martin, um, who beat Bo Nickel in the national finals when he was a freshman, which is, he's a three-time champ. He was almost a four-timer, which only four people have ever done. Um, and Bo Nickel was wrestling Miles Martin for the team tile, title, Penn State versus Ohio State. And Martin took him down. It looked like he was going to put Bo Nickel on his back. And Bo Nickel kicked him through and pinned him and iced the tournament, iced the national championship for his team while winning his own national championship against an incredible wrestler who he wasn't supposed to pin, who he did pin. The dude's just like a competitor. He competes. He's so good. He's so good when there's a big moment, when it's the spotlight. Um, so, yeah, Bo Nickel's going to be great. Oh, no, Eddie's going to get copyright by himself. Yes. <laughs> my TikTok account is going to sue my YouTube channel. What's your weight class, Eddie? Uh, my weight class now, um, I bounce between, I don't know what I want to do for the next tournament, but 72 kilos or 77 kilos, which 77 kilos is like 169 and a half, which is like I weigh like 172 to 175 naturally, so it's hardly a cut. And then the other weight class is 159 and a half, which I made for the last tournament, the U.S. Open. But that was the lightest I had ever been since high school, literally, because I wrestled 165 in college. Um, and I think it almost killed me. I think I almost died making that weight. So I don't know if I'm going to do that again. I had to make the weight two days in a row. Um, scratch weight, we call it, meaning there was no extra allowance. I don't know if I can do that again. It was freaking brutal, man. I was not eating and I was running like eight miles a day. <laughs> Bro, my man, I promised Khabib would merc Bo Nickel in the UFC. Not, I mean, Bo Nickel's 30 pounds heavier. <laughs> I don't even think Khabib himself would say that. Um, and just wait on it. Maybe right now, Khabib, I mean, obviously Khabib's got the better MMA legacy right now. Give it, Give it like two years. Two years and Bo Nickel will be UFC champ and one of the best fighters, pound for pound fighters in the world. I, I almost guarantee it. Who edits y'all's videos? Have y'all considered looking for video editors? We have. We, we are looking for video editors. Um, we have a Discord channel or server with all of our graphic designers, animators, editors. And it's like three or four people all working on a volunteer basis. Um but I edit all the videos myself, I guess. They do most of the graphic design stuff, um, like for the journal and the professional stuff like that. But for just editing videos, it's me. But, I mean, that's what we need most at Midwestern Marks. The number one thing we need is editors, um, animators, graphic designers, people to do the skills that we don't have. <laughs> Why is Gordon Ryan all over YouTube shorts now? I don't know. He's all over mine, too. I can edit. All right. Well, we might have to, we might have to, uh, have to hire some people as editors or have some people on. I'd love you to do that. Pay to me. I'll hit you up on discord. Hey, yo, Haas from infrared just did a video of him interviewing MAGA people about communism. Oh, that could be interesting. Yeah, we could definitely watch that. Shoot. Let's talk about Iran though. I got friggin' sidetracked. So, um, the first, I mean, we could watch Richard Medhurst's video. Um, it's very 
pretty much basic. Just gives you like what's been going on. We know um, what ha- or what the event was um, that that triggered these protests, um, and then how the U.S. is is going to try and use it for their own interests, right? So, like, I think. I'll basically give a disclaimer before we start talking about this. Um, But nobody here is saying like, you know, we defend the morality police or whatever. We think that the Islamic revolution in Iran is equivalent to a socialist revolution, right? We've always, and Midwestern Marx especially said, and and most anti-imperialist socialists say this, right? They have criticisms of Iran, right? They don't act like Iran is just, you know, a socialist or communist country, um, the same way China is, but Iran is opposed to the U S 70% of Iran's industry and banks are owned by the state, by the government, which means Western multinationals don't get to touch them. Uh, the U S holds deadly sanctions on Iran, which keep people in malnutrition and kill like 40,000 people a year. I believe the estimates are, um, Iran is a major trade partner of Venezuela. Um, they've foregone the U S embargo. One time they sent Venezuela oil, uh, despite the U.S. sanctions prevent trying to prevent countries from sending Venezuela oil. And the U.S. stole it, stole four tankers of oil, brought it back to Houston and gave it away to Western companies. Um, so, you know, despite the fact that Iran is not socialist, they are absolutely opposed to the U.S., right? They are absolutely part of the anti-U.S. empire uh, global alliance that's sort of forming, mostly because their resources, you know, are, are being used to develop themselves rather than... Um, rather than you know being exploited by western multinationals okay so that means we support iran's sovereignty we support you know uh them bringing people out of poverty what they're doing developmentally with their economy um and we do not support u.s efforts to overthrow iran we don't support the u.s efforts to take an internal conflict in iran or take real protests in iran um, and turn them into regime change uh, turn them into a violent separatist movement that uh, destroys the revolution and um, uh, destroys democracy and development and all these things. Uh, obviously, that's not what we support. But of course, you can still criticize the Iranian regime. You can criticize the morality police. Uh, you can definitely criticize the killing of this uh, Iranian girl that sparked these protests. Um, but just keep in mind, the U.S. is going to use any kind of event they can in Iran to foment regime change. Right. And just don't be so naive to think that because something legitimate happened in Iran, something legitimately worth being concerned about happened in Iran, that all of a sudden the U.S. cares so deeply about Iran. Oh, we just want to help now, Iran. We're going to bring you human rights, just like we were doing with our sanctions that killed 40,000 of you per year. You know, we're going to bring you human rights because one person died um, and, and, you know, I mean, the the Iranian regime kills one person. Now the U.S. is going to come and overthrow your government, despite the fact that we've killed 40,000 of you with our sanctions per year. Um, Right. The U.S. doesn't care about Iran. The U.S. is looking out for their own interests and they'll use anything real on the ground that they can to escalate it into a separatist movement. Um, So that's my take on it so far. That's what I think the U.S. is trying to do. Um, And our good buddy, Ramiro Sebastian Funes one of the greatest journalists, content makers, socialists of our time, uh, did this awesome interview with, oh shoot, I don't have the name of her yet, it's over here, um, Marzi Hashemi, a U.S. journalist who is currently living and working in Iran. She was born in New Orleans and studied journalism at Louisiana State University, LSU. Um, I wonder if she met Joe Burrow. Uh, She has been in broadcast journalism for over 30 years. Currently, she hosts a weekly television program called Hidden Files and works as a producer. She was a senior anchor for Press TV for 12 years. She has made documentaries, mostly concentrating on the situation of black people in the United States. So that is who our comrade Ramiro is interviewing here about Iran um, and about the recent conflict in Iran. Let's see what she has to say. That the United States and others, they don't give a damn about <laughs> an Iranian woman dying. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Of course. Because we have had and we have major sanctions against each against against us. I mean, I, I did an interview about two months ago and I talked to these individuals who have these rare diseases and everything. Um, it's a, a EB, it's called the butterfly uh, disease. And these people have this very, very sensitive skin and they have to get the special. Um, bandage or 
look at Ramiro. He's just talking to her on the phone and holding the phone up to his mic. This man is going to get attacked by the CIA. He's just finding ways to talk to anti-imperialists and connect various anti-imperialists all around the globe. It doesn't matter how much, you know, regime change propaganda is going on about a certain issue. Ramiro is not afraid to talk about it. He doesn't care what you say about him. Um, this man is a legend. I love Ramiro. Wrapping or otherwise their skin peels. They have to do this two or three times a day. There's one company, a Swedish company, that actually sells this these uh, these uh, bandages um, or wrappings. Uh, the United States won't let that Swedish company sell to Iran. Mm. We have people dying every day. That's just one. And a perfect example of how Scandinavian countries like Sweden, these wonderful social democracies that um, people like Kyle Kalinske will call, I don't know if Kyle Kalinske calls them socialists, actually. He probably calls them capitalist, but that some people will call socialist. Um, they aid imperialism by helping the U.S. with their embargoes, helping the U.S. with their interventions. Uh, Swedish banks refusing to give bandages to Iranian people. Very similar to the Swiss uh, banks and the banks in Switzerland who wouldn't help Cuba, uh, who wouldn't allow Cuba to make payment for ventilators, medical ventilators they needed. Um, or the Scandinavian banks who wouldn't let Venezuela make their COVAX payment. They let Venezuela pay for 90% of their uh, COVID vaccines and then prevented them from paying the final 10% so that they could keep all the money that Venezuela paid without ever sending them the vaccines themselves, using the pandemic to try and kill people and foment regime change. Of these diseases. <laughs> I love your intro, Romero. I'm just trying to avoid copyright. That's all. Romero, I have seen, it is unbelievable. Like, if I had never come to Iran and never lived in Iran, I would imagine that this would be a country, and I'd love to hear from your viewers and stuff, you know, what, what their first image comes to their mind when they hear Iran, um, because they have created this negative image over the four decades of being a backwards place um that uh people are repressed um you know just cut off from modernity cut off from the world and it's interesting because when people have come here they either just visiting or um, been invited to various conferences they're shocked they're absolutely stunned i mean i had one person once um prior to getting here was saying like do you guys have do you guys have electricity? <laughs> you live in, like, what oh kind of houses God. do you live in? I'm like, do you know how old this civilization is over here? That's so interesting. Iranian people are stunned by what Americans think of them, by how ignorant Americans are about Iranian society and how developed they are and the fact that they have electricity, which Derek Ford told us a very, very similar thing about Korea. He said he would tell people in not just North Korea, but he would tell people in South Korea the kind of stuff that the Americans believe about the North. And South Koreans were like, you guys really believe that shit? Like, you believe the stuff that they print in the tabloids? You know, it'd be like Americans looking at People magazine, you know, these uh, tabloid magazines reporting on celebrities' love lives. And being like, you know, everything in here is fact. This is all truthful. And, and People Magazine loves talking about Kim Jong-un. They'll publish stories like Kim Jong-un makes everyone in the country get the same haircut as him. And South Koreans are like, Americans really believe this shit? Like, what? <laughs> we are the most propagandized country in the world. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So on the one hand, they paint a picture of, oh, this country that's going after, you know, uh, nuclear bombs. And, okay, so they have the sophistication to deal with nukes, you're saying. On the other hand, we have people who have an image of, oh, my God, you mean these people living in the desert, right? They have nothing. So this is how they create. And, and we know, I mean, if we look at the images from so many countries that they try to create, first of all, they work on that part of it. And then they can say whatever they want about it because unfortunately the average person will accept it because they've been demonized for so long. Beautifully said. And uh, just as uh, 
Uh, one of my good friends, uh, Erica Gaines, says in the chat, yes, decades of propaganda to validate the decades of sanctions. And I totally agree with you, uh, Marcia. There's so much propaganda and nonsense about Iran. Everything that the U.S. and Israel accuses Iran of is actually true about the U.S.-backed, Western-backed entities like Saudi Arabia and even the U.S. itself in terms of detention, having the largest prison population in the world, Israel spying and censoring people. So it's just a, it's crazy to see that. It's infuriating. And honestly, it's been so frustrating these past few days, just getting into so many debates with people, even people who consider themselves anti-imperialist or left or progressive yes. who are saying, yes. oh, well, you know, we have to, this is a grassroots uprising. Okay, so what the U.S. and the Western powers are supporting it, you know, um, this is, you know, neither Tehran nor Washington. And, uh, you know, as somebody who has been victim to kidnapped by the U.S. government, by the U.S. state, who has been in, detained illegally by the U.S. government, um, you know, what is your perspective about what's going on? First of all, give us a rundown of what exactly happened, uh, the case of uh, Masa Amini, uh, what exactly happened yeah, and, and, and how... Um... My uh, phone on tick. my phone just like overheated. It was like super hot. So that's why we're not live on TikTok anymore, if people were wondering. Um, but <laughs> um, this is so, so true. These these people who are saying, you know, neither Tehran nor Washington. Okay. That's naive though, right? You don't have, like I was saying at the beginning, I don't support the morality police, right? Or um, I'm a socialist. I'd rather have a socialist revolution versus an Islamic revolution. Um, but still support Iran's sovereign, sovereignty and their economic development and everything like that. And understanding that the U.S. is going to take, you know, any little thing on the ground, any, you know, sense of anger towards the regime or discontent with the regime. And they're going to try and push, push for color revolution or push for a coup uh, for their own interests, for their own economic interests, to destroy Iran's economic development, destroy Iran's sovereignty and, and be able to pillage Iran and allow Western multinationals to pillage the country like they've done to Iraq. I mean, that's what the U.S. has wanted to do in Iran for years. So, you know, when it comes to these protests, you can say neither the U.S. nor Tehran, sure. But the U.S. is using what may be legitimate protests to try and overthrow Tehran, right? So if you just say, um, you know, I support the protests, the protests are good, two thumbs up to the protests, but I don't support the U.S. empire or the Iranian government. Well, by default, you're supporting the U.S. empire. Right. Because the U.S. empire is going to lie about whatever is going on on the ground. They're going to funnel a bunch of money in and or arms and, and try and um, turn it into a violent color revolution, try and get separatist groups um, or extremist groups to take power of the, the protests and, and turn it into a violent revolution. Exactly like they did with Euromaidan in Ukraine. You know, there were legitimate protests at first and then through millions of dollars from the NED and NGOs, funneled into groups like the Azov Battalion and right sector, Euromaidan was turned into a violent coup. That's exactly what the U.S. is trying to do. So, you know, by saying neither the U.S. nor Iran and then saying, but I support these protests, you know, if you're not giving that added context, if you're not explaining what the U.S. is trying to do with these protests, you're essentially just supporting the U.S. State Department then, which is why it's super hard to be an anti-imperialist when the U.S. is actually trying to overthrow a country. Because they'll make you seem like a piece of shit. They'll be like, oh, this person doesn't care about the protests. They don't care about feminism. They don't care about this girl who was killed by the Iranian police. Like, no, we do. We just don't want the U.S. to use that to overthrow Iran and kill millions of people like they did in Iraq. Because that's a whole lot worse. How has the Western imperialist powers been taking advantage of the situation? Right. It's been an amazing uh, situation. I mean, because I've seen, um, of course, I've been in Iran a while now, and I've seen many attempts, actually, um, to try to overthrow this government um, or try to get the people to turn against the government. And I have to say, this is the, I think the... Hey, Cobra Commander, it's you. <laughs> we got double Cobra Commander. Cobra Commander is everywhere. 
Yadig yeah, that 25 new Arab Spring update just dropped. That's such this is such a funny comment and such a true comment. Which, yeah, like I said, we have the Iraq example, an example of the US trying to overthrow a country for human rights and killing millions of people and pillaging their resources. But just look at Libya and Syria, where the US used the internet. The internet and online communication was basically the focal point of these color revolutions of massing together these uh, opposition coalitions, which are basically just a bunch of right wing terrorist US or pro US extremist groups in Libya and Syria that the US was able to weld together into a coalition of rebels, um, largely using the internet, you know, largely using um, mass communication or forms of mass communication. It's exactly what they're trying to do um, with Iran. Most coordinated one that I have seen um, on so many levels, exactly the point that you just made. Um, we've had traditional people who are traditionally anti-imperialist um, fall for this one this time around. What happened with Masa Amini? Um, she was detained. She was detained. Yes, we do have laws in Iran. Um, that women and men should dress conservatively mm -hmm. and the women should wear a scarf. What we've been seeing over, especially since the, the with Rouhani government the last four years, basically what we had seen was that, I mean, some women wear it, some women don't. So that's where we were and are. Um, you see some women, they may have it on their shoulder or not wear it at all. And then you'll see others who are fully covered and that's how... We have been living with each other and whatever. Um I've actually read a decent amount about this. I had, for whatever reason, in high school, we had like a whole unit on Iran in English class. We learned about Iran or like we had to pick a country or something. And I picked Iran because I loved their wrestling team and did a bunch of research into their wrestling team. But yeah, I mean, forever, the more traditional or more, you know, I, I wouldn't say more religious, but the more fundamentalist i guess is the word but i don't want to say more devout but whatever the the more hardline um muslim women would wear their scarf covering up all their hair every little bit of their hair and then the you know more progressive ones are the ones who um were critical of the government or um ones who are critical of the headscarf or the hijab or you know maybe just critical of the hijab that covers all the hair, the rules surrounding the hijab or whatever, they would show some of their hair, right? They would let some of their hair out as like a form of protest is what I read. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I might be wrong about that. It's definitely not, I'm definitely not an expert in hijabs, but I thought that Iranian women were, have been allowed to show their hair for a long time. Um, but we'll see what, what she says. Um, so, um, you know, I, I saw different signs uh, within the last year that we were probably going to be targeted and the women would be used for this. And I mean, this is always um, something that we see in different places that they that the imperialists use. So um, when Masa Amini, we, we heard that she had been arrested and the first things that came out, like in social media, was that this woman had been arrested she had been beaten to death okay then we find out that she you know she had not died she was in a coma and then it was um you know that she had been um just just totally abused and so many different things and then um the cctv cameras uh, the footage was released and we see this woman in this class. And so what they do, they take them in class and like, okay, so these are the reasons why, you know, this is the law, you should dress conservatively, um, and this type of thing. So she's in this classroom setting and she's sitting down and, um, and then she gets up and she talks to, um, I guess one of the teachers, guards, whatever you want to call her. And she's talking and I, I don't know if you guys have seen the video. I don't even know if they show the yeah. video over there. Mm -hmm. Um, have y'all seen the video? I don't think we played it on this show. I don't know. Richard Medhurst posted the video. I'll try and pull it up here while we listen so I can show it to y'all. Um, I have seen the video once or twice. Okay. And, and then she passes out. Well, what we have found out 
I mean, maybe from the stress of being uh, detained, it could have an effect. I'm not saying it could not have, um, but we do know that she had the previous medical problems. Um, and this, this whole thing is being investigated, let me say. I mean, right after this happened, even the president of the country said um, it has to be thoroughly investigated. And if we see that there's, if there's a problem, if someone caused this, whatever. It was where Pilgrim in Ramiro's comments there. Sorry, I keep stopping it because I keep seeing people from our audience in Ramiro's comments. What up, where Pilgrim? A lot of crossover between our audiences. Investigated, and if we see that there's if there's a problem, if someone caused this, whatever, then they will be prosecuted accordingly. So, this is okay. Let me just say that situations happen in, in many countries um, as far as dealing with police or whatever. But the thing is, is that when it happens, anything happens in Iran, mm. all of a sudden it becomes systemic. Everyone, yep. I mean, you know, the U.S. You can you can shoot you know a black guy eighty times, and <laughs> who has done nothing or whatever. But okay, but you know, you don't question the overall system. It's that let's just get justice in this particular case. Absolutely, they'll always question the overall system when it's a country they want to destroy. Um, but never when it's the U S they'll never question capitalism, maybe capitalism and the prison industrial complex have something to do with all these police murders. Maybe the fact that the police are militarized and that companies are making tons and tons of money off of keeping the prisons filled with bodies, which is why we perpetrated the drug war. Maybe this has something to do with the violent police. No, of course not. We can't look systemically when it comes to the U S only Iran is authoritarian. Um, so here's the video. Uh, I might go refill my. Sorry, I muted myself. I might go refill my water while I play this. We're referring to if it was her hijab or something else that she was wearing, but they released the CCTV footage. So I'm going to show you the footage. This is what they put out. OK, so they've, been, they've circled her in red. Right. And, and she gets up and then you'll see in a moment she suddenly collapses for no reason. I, I don't understand what 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 happened there exactly. But. Yeah, you can see they're they're they're, uh, you know, they're telling her off because of her clothing and then she she's feeling physically unwell and collapses. So. That alone to me leads me to believe there's more to this story than they're telling. OK, let me show you the rest of the footage. There's some more footage. I don't know if you guys have seen this. It's when she's being taken away, taken away in an ambulance. Yeah, you can see her being carried here. So she's being carried away and then she's put into an ambulance and that's that's all we have. That's it. Now. My understanding, and I've seen this in many, many outlets is that the the proof, the quote unquote evidence that she was beaten by the police comes from her father. Her father said that Mahza and his son were together and uh, they were both beaten. That's what he's saying, okay? So Miss Amini's father said that he was not allowed by authorities to see all of her body after it had been wrapped for burial. And just her face and feet were visible. He said there were bruises on her feet and he asked doctors to examine it, but he never heard back from them. And there's basically this back and forth going on where you have the, um, the uh, director. So this is Tehran's director of forensic medicine. He's saying that she had pre-existing health issues and her father responding by saying, no, that's not true. She's, she's never been to a hospital in the last 22 years. That's basically what they've been saying. Also, the fact that um, uh, the Iranian health officials are saying she had an operation on a brain tumor or something when she was eight years old. So I don't know whether either of these things are true. I'm just telling you what both sides are saying, what her family are saying and what the Iranian government are saying. What I have in front of me, what I've just shown to you, all we have is this video, okay? All we have is this video of her collapsing before she's taken anywhere. So you guys explain that to me. Explain to me why, if she was beaten, why did she collapse? Are those two things related? Maybe both are true, but for the moment, we only have the video. Now, in, in response, I'm just going to show you some of these, these protests. It's very strange. And, you know, 
again, like I'm still coming at this from the standpoint, like you can be definitely critical of the police, the Iranian morality police. Um, but it is very strange. And of course, you know, people call you a conspiracy theorist if you question these things at all, you know, if you're even critical of these narratives at all. But we have things like the Naira testimony, you know, where the U.S. just straight up lied, straight up fabricated evidence um, of human rights abuses uh, to justify the Gulf War, a regime change operation. So, you know, there is precedence for that. But I'm, I'm definitely not saying like this was fake or something like the event was fake. Um, I imagine it was probably uh real and like you said like uh the the last lady on ramiro's show said um even the president of iran said this is very strange and needs to be investigated and it does um but the u.s is obviously going to try and um you know whatever the case may be with the event you know whatever the details of the event were the u.s is going to try and use it for their own interests they're going to try and use it for regime change and um sam or crazy Hayes, i don't know if you were here earlier um in the stream earlier when we were talking about uh ramiro's video um we're doing the introduction uh to this segment on iran um but we were saying it's okay to criticize the morality police right it's okay to criticize the islamic revolution um it's okay to criticize things like that but you know if you just say i support these protests full stop um, which is you're saying here, we we should fix our systems, but th that doesn't mean we can't support women rising up for the right to wear, not wear a piece of clothing. If you just support the women rising up, right, just the protests, you're going to end up supporting the U.S. State Department because whatever protests are going on, whatever real grassroots discontent is going on, the U.S. is going to throw arms at, or, I mean, maybe not arms, but they're going to throw money at it. They're going to throw propaganda at it. They're going to throw every regime change method, every hybrid war method in the book at it to try and inflame it into a color revolution, to try and inflame it into a coup. So if you're just saying, you know, I support the protests with two thumbs up without criticizing what the U.S. is going to do, you're going to end up supporting protests that that escalate similar to Euromaidan um, or, or someone made the Arab Spring comparison earlier. You know, where all these social Democrats and all these leftists in the U.S. were saying, oh, freedom for Syria and Libya, freedom from the dictators Assad and, and Gaddafi. And what it really was, was the U.S. State Department um, backing terrorists and backing separatists and backing extremists and having them pretend to be fighting for human rights, having them pretend to be freedom loving rebels. And it's thrown the countries into chaos. Obviously, Libya went from one of the most prosperous countries in Africa to a country torn apart by civil war with an open air slave market. Um, in Syria, the war is winding down, but you know it's been absolute chaos and they've had so much infrastructure destroyed. Um, and these rebel coalitions backed by the US are basically just uh, an amalgamation of terrorist extremist groups who the US welded together to foment regime change. Um, or you have the Euromaidan protests, which started you know, as legitimate protests in Ukraine then the U.S. funnels a bunch of money and arms into groups like Right Sector and the Azov Battalion, and they turn these legitimate protests into a right-wing violent color revolution where they're burning trade unionists alive, right? So if you just give the protest two thumbs up and you don't question the U.S. narrative and you just say, yes, every protest you see, whether it's being influenced by the State Department or not, you know, these are all just women protesting their rights. This is all just about human rights. Um you're inadvertently, you know, lending credence to the U.S. State Department narrative. You have to point these things out. We have to point out that the U.S. doesn't care about Iran. We have to point out the U.S. history of turning legitimate grievances into right-wing, violent, undemocratic separatist movements um, and regime change efforts. Um, it would be extremely naive, right, to look at the way that the U.S. media is just going, Iran, 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 protest, 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 overthrow the government, hate the Iranian government. Um, the way that they're doing that right now and just think, you know, that that every protest we see or that the U.S. State Department's support for these protests is all just about human rights. The U.S. State Department never supports human rights. The U.S. State Department never cares about Muslim people. The U.S. State Department has never cared about Muslim women, um, whether they're oppressed by the Iranian government or not. And, and now is no different. Um, so yeah, 
That's why I gave a disclaimer before uh, before we started talking about this. But I don't know if I don't know if you were here for that part of the stream. This is what people have been doing in the streets. So you have women like cutting off their hair in, in this example. You've had other women ripping off their um, headscarves, their hijab uh, in protest and saying that, you know, it's not just about her being killed. The whole thing has to go because she was detained by morality police. So their, their logic is that not only the hijab has to go, the whole government has to go. This whole Islamic um, Republic has to go. Now, what does that sound like to you? Who does that sound like to you? That sounds like Israel. That sounds like the United States. That sounds like everyone who does not like Iran for various reasons. So you you have people that are really like dying for an opportunity to jump into Iran's internal politics. And this is one of them. It's like with Syria, when you had the war starting in Syria in 2011, you know, the, the original claims, what were they? You had people protesting and they were killed by the government, right? And then it went from that, this claim, to... Hey, let's give weapons to Al-Qaeda. <laughs> Hold on a second. Hold on a second. So a boy or a woman or someone. Exactly what I said. I forgot that Medhurst brought that up. It's exactly what I said with the Arab Spring. Right? Hey, don't you care about human rights? Don't you care about human rights? These guys are protesting their evil big bad government. They're protesting evil Gaddafi and evil Assad. Don't you care about them? We need to give a bunch of money and weapons to Al-Qaeda so they can fight Assad and Gaddafi. We need to fund the rebel coalitions made up of a bunch of Saudi Arabia-backed Sunni extremist groups um, who behead people. That, that's how we can support human rights and democracy. And insane. Insane. Press TV got banned in the EU due to serial coverage. That's crazy. And I imagine, I mean, that's crazy how much censorship is going on in the EU. Just the stuff that, I mean, in, in Europe that you've been talking about uh, during this, um, during this stream. And I feel like that's the direction the U.S. wants to go now, right? When you have, because you have British journalists like Paul Mason um, arguing that the gray zone needs to be banned and working together with U.S. State Department operatives and British State Department operatives and various private interests to try and ban the gray zone very similar outlet to press tv who exposed the u.s um proxy war on syria and in the u.s dirty war covert war on syria um every step of the way the u.s would love to ban them the same way europe has banned various outlets um so i wonder if they're using the eu as a model for how they want to uh, start censoring our speech israel palestine thoughts free palestine i have a check out my tiktok account the TikTok is midwesternmarks.com. I have a whole playlist called uh, um, Free Palestine. So, Yeah, so interesting stuff with Iran. The last thing I'll say about it, don't be an anti-imperialist in hindsight, right? Don't be the guy who gives all the protests two thumbs up uncritically now. But then 10 years later, when more, you know, more comes out about this and we find out how involved the CIA and the U.S. and the NED were, you know, go, oh, now I'm against it. Because that was everybody. You know, I mean, that's everybody every time there's a regime change effort. Um, but with Libya, Syria, Iraq, um, you know, there were tons and tons of leftists going, oh, we need to support this one. You know, this intervention's for human rights. I believe the U.S. this time. And it was a lie. And then 20 years later, those same people are like, yeah, I'm against Iraq now because of what we found out about it. Like, yeah, but why couldn't you see it when it was happening? Why did you trust the U.S. State Department when it was happening? Have you not learned that they always try and weaponize your compassion? Have you not learned that they always try and make you think you need to fight for human rights when really you're fighting for regime change? This is what they do every time. I am pro-Israeli, and I want to understand the situation from both sides. Uh, I respectfully disagree. Can we talk? No. <laughs> You're not going to convince me. I've spoken with many Palestinians. I've done a Zoom chat for hours with members of the IDF, the Israeli military. Um, I've been researching Palestine heavily for the past four or five years. 
I did a whole bunch of videos about Shireen Abu Akla, who was recently murdered by Israeli apartheid forces. Um, it's an issue I understand quite well, and it's not one where you're going to convince me that it's a both sides type of thing. Um, people should also watch our, our Israel content with Romero. I mean, Romero, sorry, not Romero, Romero, um, where we were discussing how, you know, what Western corporations, um, helped create Israel in the first place. Uh Oh, I lost my camera y'all. The browser has lost connection. What is going on here? The CIA got me, huh? There I am. <laughs> My camera must have just come disconnected. Thoughts on thousands of men leaving Russia attempting to avoid the draft? Uh, I haven't seen that. I Jeff Young shared a really good piece the other day. Um, a lot of the European countries, a lot of the West European countries um, are kind of filled up with refugees, right? They immediately swung their doors open to Ukrainian refugees, um, but now they're uh, filled up. And, and Russia has begun taking Ukrainian refugees, and there's tons and tons of people from Ukraine now going to Russia and being in Russia. And Russia is taking them in because Russia needs workers in various places. Um, so even though they're at war with Ukraine, you know, they have labor shortages in certain places and they've started taking refugees and settling refugees in the east. So you have Ukrainian refugees going east. Um, and obviously that helps Russia's, um, you know, war propaganda effort. If they can say, look, we're, we're allowing refugees and, and we're giving them jobs and stuff that uh, makes them look better. Um, so it's good for them that way. But uh, yeah, it's been interesting to follow where the refugees are going and um yeah, I have not seen that people are fleeing Russia to avoid the draft, though. Um, where did I, I'd look at it if you sent it? Ethan Stewart, five dollar super chat. Thank you very much for the support. I wish I could stick around to watch the rest of the live, but I have to go to work. LOL. Love your content and thanks for what you're doing. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, thank you for giving us five dollars. That's like, you know, half an hour of work. Um, if you're getting paid minimum wage or a little above minimum wage. So thank you very much for your support. Really appreciate it. Hope you have a good work day. Um, yeah. Not real. <laughs> I figured it wasn't. Mm hmm. I will mute you because you're an obvious plant. Cobra Commander, uh, Crazy Haze isn't a plant. That's I know I'm from wrestling. <laughs> We're friends in real life. Uh, so, yeah, don't ban him, please. Um, Sam, you are saying some dumb shit, though. <laughs> like, no offense. Uh, but you know that I think some of the things that you say about existing socialist countries... Uh, are not things that I agree with, and that's okay. And I'm always down to explain why I disagree. Um, okay, before we talk, I want to talk about the School of the Americas because I was reading about it recently. Uh, but since we're talking about Russia and Ukraine, this is an article that I saw in New York Times titled Ukrainian, or sorry, I can't remember what it was titled. Let's go to it. Um, a frontline mystery. Was he scouting for firewood or for Russia? And in this article, the New York Times journalist basically follows around um, some Ukrainian soldiers who capture this old 69 year old man who says he's out looking for firewood. And they just put a bag over his head and carry him around all day with no evidence that, that he was a Russian soldier, with no evidence that he's fighting for against the Ukrainian military. They just carry this dude around with a bag on his head. And then the New York Times ends the story by being like, well, now he's going to get interrogated by Ukrainian security. Like, what? You can't, They just kidnapped this Russian guy? The Ukrainian military? Um, the Ukrainian militias largely made up of groups like Azov who are, uh, want to ban the Russian language 
and are against ethnic Russians and have been waging a war against eth ethnic Russians in the name of Ukrainian nationalist Stefan Bandera since 2014. You know, those people just capture this random Russian guy with no evidence and bring him to Ukrainian intelligence. And the New York Times is like, oh, well, what can you do? No problem here. You know, this guy was Russian. He might have been a combatant. It's okay to arrest unarmed civilians and put bags on their head and interrogate them um, because of their ethnicity. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a crazy article. <laughs> And they they literally New York Times literally interviews the guy and he says he's looking for firewood while he's got this thing on his head and his hands are tied behind his back. Um, you know, and the New York Times as government watchdogs, which is hilarious to even say that because they're more like government poodles, um, as are most of the media. But they're supposed to be critical of all governments, right? And, and critical of what the state is saying. But instead of being critical, instead of NYT being like, hey, you know, these these or this Ukrainian military that we know is made up of a bunch of right wing militias is just capturing Russian speakers and putting bags on their head and bringing them to Ukrainian intelligence, even though they're unarmed and said that they're a civilian looking for firewood. You know, we're not going to criticize this at all. We're not going to question this at all. We're just going to be like, oh, you know, what can you do? Isn't war bad? Um, yeah, the only evidence they had was Russian rubles that they found in the guy's pocket. So you could just find, you know, another kind of, you can find Russian currency in anyone's pocket, which, you know, in Europe right now is one of the strongest currencies. So if you're living in Eastern Ukraine, where you're literally right next to Russia and, you know, like. 50% of the people are ethnic Russians. It makes sense that you would have rubles. Uh, but apparently that was enough to arrest him and bring him in to be interrogated slash tortured by Ukrainian intelligence. Um, yeah, and I mean, we even have, they say at one point, you know, both forces in this war have committed human rights abuses, but Russia has committed way more. Um, that's the only kind of criticism or pushback they give here against the soldiers who just put a bag over this civilian's head and, and took him away to be, uh, interrogated by, um, Ukrainian intelligence. Um, is, oh, both sides have, have done things bad, but Russia's worse. Russia's worse. And that's why it's okay to capture random Russian civilians and put bags on their head and take them to be tortured by Ukrainian intelligence. You know, we can trust the Ukrainian military. They're not Russia. They're the good guys. Right? Just ignore Azov Battalion's stated goals and right sector stated goals and ignore the 2014 US fat coup and ignore the fact that they've been setting up their military and civilian areas to use them as human shields. Russia's worse, and therefore Ukrainian soldiers can do whatever they want. They can capture as many civilians as they want. It's just weird how American media works and like people are so used to it. I feel like they would read that article and not think anything of it. Right? People would read that article of the American journalists following around Ukrainian soldiers um, who are bringing this man to be interrogated by Ukrainian intelligence who do not have a good history, who have banned opposition parties. Obviously, this is the government that banned the Russian language, even though you have tons and tons of ethnic Russians and Russian speaking people um, in eastern Ukraine and the Donbass. This is an extremely anti-Russian government, an extremely Russophobic government um, run by a bunch of admirers of Stefan, Stefan Bandera and hardcore Ukrainian nationalists just capturing Russian people and bringing them into intelligence and be like, oh, they had rubles in their pocket. And Americans are like, oh, yeah, this seems about right. You know, Russia bad, Russia bad, you know, and, and they don't even expect the media to be critical of this Ukrainian government. They don't expect the media to be critical of the ruling class. Um, there's no expectation for that in the U.S. because the media is just a government lapdog. You know, not only are they not a watchdog, not only are they completely uncritical of the government and the capitalist ruling class, but they serve the capitalist ruling class. They're part of the bourgeoisie. You know, multi-bajillionaire investors own our news corporations the same way they own everything else in the um, factors of production.
it was a short article, but I felt like it was worth covering. Um, so I want to talk about this now. I've been reading this really good book called The Plot to Overthrow Venezuela, how the U.S. is orchestrating a coup for oil. And this is by Dan Kovalik. He's got a foreword from Oliver Stone, who did the amazing movie Ukraine on Fire recently. Um, did a great documentary. I don't know about documentary, but a couple great exposés about JFK um, and the CIA's role in the JFK assassination. Uh, but in detailing the history of Latin America in this book and the history of U.S. imperialism in Latin America, he talks about the School of the Americas, which was this program that the CIA and State Department set up in Latin America that they brag about um, today to train U.S.-backed militias, train and arm U.S.-backed paramilitaries. So militarize them, uh, give them military training give them support and communication with the U.S. Oftentimes, uh, these like the Argentinian military junta or Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship in, uh, in Chile um, or Hugo Bonser in Brazil, they would be given kill lists by the CIA, lists of all the, the left-wingers in the area, all the socialists, all the anti-imperialists, all the communists, um, all the trade unionists, all the working class leaders. And then these uh, U.S.-backed military groups trained up in the school of the Americas by the U.S. State Department, armed by the U.S. State Department, would go kill these people or torture these people and basically tried to root the radical left-wing socialist ideology out of Latin America by killing anybody who supported it. Um, and that's what the school of the Americas was all about. That's what Operation Condor was all about. Um and, you know, you see some recently we found that the Ukrainian government have been doing the same thing. They banned right wing. I mean, they banned left wing opposition parties. They banned the Communist Party. Um, and now we found that the government has been using these kill lists to hunt people down. Um, and one of our buddies, one of uh, the journalists who follows Midwestern Marx and does great journalism on Russia named Wyatt Reed, uh, found out he was on a Ukrainian government kill list. You know, they had him on this list to, to murder him for doing journalism. Um, think about people like Ava Kareen Bartlett, who's been in the Donbass since this conflict started, writing about what she sees. She's got to be on a kill list, too. So it's crazy. And this is, you know, these are strategies the U.S. honed in in Latin America with the School of the Americas. And eventually people kind of figured out, you know, what the School of Americas was all about. Like, this is just the U.S. training right wing guerrilla forces and um, giving them weapons to carry out their interests in Latin America. Uh, so it started to get a bad rep and the U.S. just changed the name and they've changed the name a couple times since the 1960s once they get called out. But this is the School of Americas is still in existence today. It's still in operation today. It changed names in 2001 um, again, like I said, because they were getting such a bad rap, but this is still the School of Americas. It's just now called the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. So they just added a really long, complicated name. Like the School of Americas is a pretty bad name for the imperialists. Because socialists can look like that, just look at that and be like, it's a torture school. It's a murder school. It's an imperialist school. You're just militarizing right-wing guerrillas. Um, versus if you call it something super long and super complicated, the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. You know, it's harder to point that out. It, it's less catchy than the School of the Americas, where the U.S. trains up terrorists and assassins to kill left-wingers. Um, instead, they have the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, where they do that. Um, and it's a long name, so hopefully everyone will ignore what we're doing in Latin America is um, apparently what they think. But it isn't, like... This institution should have been immediately dismantled, is immediately disbanded once we found out what the School of Americas was all about, right? The fact that the U.S. was talking about spreading democracy and freedom when they were really giving a bunch of arms, weapons, funding, and training to right-wing extremist terrorists. Um, but instead of, you know, instead of disbanding that, instead of smashing that armed body of the state, as Lenin would say, uh, they just rename it. They just changed the name, um, but the institution itself is still the same. It's still going to enforce U.S. imperialism in Latin America. It's still going to kill people and torture people in Latin America, but it's not called the School of Americas anymore, so it's okay. Um, 
It's wild. I mean, it's just, I know that nobody in the chat needs an example of this. Um, but it's an example of how the armed bodies of the state, uh, how the dictatorship of capital that is our state, um, will always be controlled by the ruling economic class unless we, you know, move towards socialism, unless the workers uh, seize power of that state from the capitalist class and begin seizing power of the economy, of the productive forces, of the means of production. Um, that's the only way to transform our society. Otherwise, you know, we can go, hey, you guys are killing and torturing people at the School of America. And they'll go, hey, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry about that we'll change the name and then we'll be like, are you going to stop the killing and torturing? And they're like, yeah, totally. And then five years later, we get a bunch of leaked reports. It's like, you guys didn't stop doing the killing and torturing. And like, Oh yeah, our bad, but we changed the name. Right. Um, and on and on and on like this forever <laughs> until you smash the state apparatus, smash the armed bodies of the state and, and rebuild them as a state, which can, um, Support the working class and maintain the rule of the proletariat. It's the only way. Main, transfer the means of production. Hi. How's everyone? Wearing caps backwards is not cool, smart, or attractive. Wow, you woke up and chose violence today, giant lobster man. You're like, hey, how's everyone? I don't like the way you're wearing your hat. Yeah, well, I don't like the way you look. And I have a hotter girlfriend than you. So, plus she told me last week she likes when I wear my hat backwards. And she's a three-time national champion, so actually nine-time, because you can win a lot of events in track. Disagree. Hat backward is my preference. Oh, oh, giant lobster man destroyed. Destroyed by facts and logic. Left is best just destroyed, you giant lobster man. That's so embarrassing for you. Everybody likes the backward hat except you. You're such a loser. You're the only person who doesn't like backward hats. Why don't you go to backward or why don't you go to we hate backward hat world and jump head first into the shallow end? Um, what's your favorite book author slash writer? Um that's a good question. Probably Lenin. Probably Vladimir Lenin. Um Ingalls is up there. Um I mean, it's kind of cheating to say Marx, but it, it really, I mean, if I'm being honest, it is Marx. Um, cause I like reading Hegel cause it's really complex, you know, but it's not super fun to read and you don't feel like he's on the money with everything he says, like you do when you read Marx. Um, Lenin, I do feel like he's on the money with everything he says, but the reason I liked Lenin and Ingalls more than Marx at first is because Lenin and Ingalls simplify things more. They quote unquote dumb it down a little bit more um, for the workers or for the masses or whatever. Um, versus Marx, when he's formulating the actual theory um, in its beginnings, uh, he's often way more complex and often more difficult to understand. And some people know that the the first book I read, the first work of theory I read, was Marx's Capital, Volume One, and I read the whole thing not really having much of any idea what it meant, not getting that much from it. Um, and the second time I read it, after reading a bunch of Lenin and Ingalls and learning the basics, um, then I was like, oh, this is the best book I've ever read. You know, this is everything Marx is saying is facts. Like every sentence, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. But, you know, like the first time reading it, I didn't really know what he was saying. Um so at first I liked Lenin and Engels because they helped me get a grasp on the basics. But once you have a grasp on the basics, then reading Marx, once you get what Marx is saying, you're like, whoa, I understand capitalism and the world and imperialism and everything now. And how the hell have we not moved to socialism yet? <laughs> I loved your series on Lenin's writing, his main book. What's it called? Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like that. Yeah, for people who don't know, we have a full breakdown of Lenin's state and revolution as well as Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Um, I'm working on... I think I'm working on utopian and scientific or am I working? No, I'm working on the origins of the 
family private property in the state. That's the next book series I have to finish, book summary series. But those take a really, really long time for me to do. And they're time consuming and they take brain power because I have to read the book and summarize it um, on paper and then film myself summarizing it. Um, and I am in graduate school right now. So, and trying to write a book and doing streams and wrestling. And I don't have time for that. So, I have audiobooks on my channel. Very cool. Check out Peta Mio's channel for audiobooks. I'm a subscriber, I know. Uh, Venezuela released seven jailed Americans. That includes oil executives. Were they terrorists or something? Probably not. They're probably just, um, I mean, I get you could consider them terrorists, but I'm sure they were trying to foment regime change. I'm sure they were trying to um, serve their own interests. I'm sure they were corrupt in some way, working with the opposition party, promoting regime change, whatever. But um, yeah, every time Venezuela does something like this, it worries me. Um, cause you know, Venezuela is always trying to like not portray themselves as authoritarian, right? They don't want to do anything that the U S can portray as authoritarian, but like one time, like a while back they released, um, or they've released people who have done things that are legitimately terroristic or that are legitimately like, you know, worthy of condemnation. And then when they release them, the people usually flee to the U S and then the U S media is like, Oh, you know, tell us about your time in a Venezuelan prison. How terrible is Maduro? How evil is socialism? Tell us why we should invade Venezuela tomorrow. Um, when, you know, and like Venezuela lets Juan Guaido walk around free when he's being funneled money from the opposition parties and from the U.S. And sometimes it's like, just arrest that freaking guy. Just throw that freaking regime change operative uh, promoting violent riots that lead to people getting killed and regime change efforts that lead to getting killed. Throw him in jail. But they don't because then the U.S. would be like, oh, Venezuela arrested the legitimate president of their country, Juan Guaido. Let's invade them. So it's a tough situation for Venezuela where they constantly have to um, maintain the authority of the proletariat, you know, a dictatorship of the proletariat without um, coming off as authoritarian uh, or allowing the U.S. smear merchants to portray them as authoritarian. Remember when in the entire restaurant threw their chairs at him? Why don't we just watch that, don't we? Um, why don't we just watch Juan Guaido get attacked by chairs? Because I just love watching him get hit by these chairs. And that's pretty much all there is to it. I'm pretty sure these were like, I don't even think these were socialist Venezuelans. I'm pretty sure these are right-wing Venezuelans or opposition Venezuelans who are just mad at Guaido because he's done such a bad job at um, either a bad job at overthrowing the country or he's just, you know, done a bad job of, of being a politician. And he's just, all he does is talk about Maduro and how evil socialism is and never actually does anything for the people. Um, but I don't think it was left-wingers. Um, yeah. <laughs> The hostility against the Venezuelan opposition leader Juan Guaido has had a new episode of violence. The leader was beaten and pushed out of a restaurant in San Carlos, capital of the Llanero state of Cojedes, while on a tour of the interior of the country to promote the electoral strategy of the Unitarian platform that supports him in the face of the 2024 presidential elections. <laughs> A footage accompanying the opposition statement shows Juan Guaido being held back as people gathering around him and someone rips his shirt off. Accusations were made that a group of ruling party associates carried out the assault. It is the second incident in less than a week. In Maracaibo last week, a political act also ended in a war of chairs. The struggle prevented him from taking a walk that he had planned. In both cases, Chavismo leaders have been singled out as the aggressors. The parallel government said the group, which was associated with the United Socialist Party of Venezuela around the South America, though, who is on a tour around the head of a plan. PSUV leaders who traditionally issue statements on social media or state television did not. Dang it, this one didn't have the. This one did not have the um, chair attack. 
That's so funny that the Juan Guaido goes, um, yes, it was the it was the Chavismo socialists who did this, who threw chairs at me. Um, we'll just blame literally anything on them. And, you know, the government didn't even respond. Like, we're not even responding to this one. I think this dude just got wrecked by chairs and he's saying that the government sent people to throw chairs at him. Like, is that is that what the most authoritarian socialist dictators do? Like, that's what Stalin would do when he really wanted to get back at someone. He's like, oh, yes, I could kill them. I could throw them in gulag. But instead, I will have 60 people show up and hit him with a plastic chair. This will teach him the evils of capitalism. <laughs> I don't know what kind of accent that was, but like, what that like you you expect us to believe the government, the Venezuelan government, who have guns and army and police at their command, sent a bunch of people to hit you with plastic chairs. Yes, uh, truly, Venezuela needs to be overthrown if the government is you know carrying out plastic chair attacks, um, coordinated plastic chairs. Crazy. I wish I could have found the actual video, though. Because that is a good video. They tried to remove it from the internet because they don't want Americans to see how unpopular Juan Guaido actually is with his country. Guaido Mobile. Did y'all know that the Venezuelan people attacked Richard Nixon's motorcade? And almost killed him. He was like the... He was some sort of government higher up. Some sort of foreign policy. Um, some sort of foreign policy position. He wasn't the president yet. Um, but the U.S. had been backing... I believe it was Carlos Andres Perez at the time. Who the U.S. claimed was a Democrat or a liberal. But was actually a brutal dictator. Who was killing communists and socialists. Um, so there were a bunch of uprisings against that in Venezuela, um, which, you know, the Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela was the culmination of years and years and years and years of grassroots struggle and class struggle on the ground, um, with the attack on Nixon's motorcade being part of it. Uh, but they literally almost killed Richard Nixon. He barely got out of there. They destroyed his car with their hands. They were just kicking it and threatening to tip it over. Um, it was considered the most dangerous attack of an American official or most violent attack of an American official ever perpetrated on foreign soil. Um, it was just Nixon was going around in the motorcade doing a parade like, hey, people of Venezuela, it's us, the U.S. You're welcome for bringing you democracy and wealth. Um, and the people of Venezuela are like, no, you brought us dictatorship and death and poverty and just started beating his ass. Just started whooping up on his motorcade and, and Richard Nixon had to had to zoom away um, because he is an oligarchic little bitch and he's not of the people. Um, so big dub first round knockout for the Venezuelan people over Richard Nixon's motorcade. Um, Richard, Nix Richard Nixon did not stand a chance. Um, the attack was denounced by Venezuelan presidential candidates, except for the incumbent leader. Whoever didn't denounce the motorcade attack is a beast. Nixon was generally applauded in the American repress for his calm and adept handling of the incident and was fed with a hero's welcome on his return to the United States. Oh, yay. You survived the Venezuelan people who are angry because you're slaughtering them and robbing them. You're a hero, Richard Nixon. Please go on to perpetrate and start the drug war which will create the prison industrial complex and allow corporations to make tons and tons of money off of throwing people in jail. You're such a good guy. You're a hero. Guaido lives in DC, does he? <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm sure he does now. They tried to Archduke Franz Ferdinand on him. Legit. The Venezuelan people just had to be so fed up at that point. They're like, we are tired of this guy. Uh, 
<sighs> well, y'all, I have a few more things we could talk about. I have, um, I have a few things. Uh, I'm going to save them for later, though. I'm going to keep the things that I want to talk about later a secret. Um, I'm not going to tell you all what I have left on my stream plan um, because they're going to be good videos and good segments. Um, One talking about Alex Jones, actually. Um, But I want to do those segments when I have more energy, when I haven't been streaming for almost two hours. Um, And right now we've been streaming for almost two hours, so I'm probably going to call it a day. Um, Might be on later with Carlos. We'll see. Uh, But I got to get my grad school homework done and whatnot. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you to everyone who sent a super chat um, or who supports us on Patreon. Uh, thank you to the moderators, Peta Mio and Cobra Commander. Um, left his best might be one too. I don't know. Cobra Commander and Peta Mio are for sure. Um, thank you all for that. Um, thanks for, yeah, thanks for everything. Let's try and do a raid here. Can I do a raid on Twitch? I've been trying to forever. I thought I had raids set up. Um, maybe I can't do a raid when I'm on StreamYard. But I want to I want to raid someone. Um I just I just want to do a raid so bad. Ads manager. Oh, I can do ads on Twitch. I'm going to get rich. I I don't know how to do it. Why it won't let me click the raid button. Oh well. Everyone go watch uh Rob Rousseau or someone cool like that. Yeah. Go watch his stream. Um I can't figure out how to do a raid, but y'all got this. All right. Peace out everyone. Much love. Thanks for hanging out. Patreon.com slash Midwestern Marks. <laughs>